Okay, um, it's just on bang on four o'clock, so I think we should probably make a start and others can join us whilst we do the little introductory bits if they would like to. Um, welcome also to people on YouTube Live um, who are hopefully watching us as well. Um, uh, as we've said, you'll be able to see all the talk, but um, unfortunately we won't be able to take questions on YouTube Live, but we will for everyone who is in the online session today. So a bit of a hello as to who I am. I'm Gail Chapman. I'm the Public Programs Officer for the um, Royal College of Physicians Museum. And today I am joined by Larry Jones, our senior curator, and of course, the star of the show, Dr. Barnabas Calder, um, who's uh, given his time today and will be giving us a very exciting talk later on. So I'm gonna hand over to someone rather more exciting, um, which is our uh, senior curator, Larry Jones. Oh, I'm sure your bit was, you know, your bit was just as important, even if possibly marginally less exciting. <laughs> so welcome, everyone. I'm really glad that you can join us today. Open House is usually one of the highlights of the event calendar for the Royal College of Physicians and for our museum, which is what Gail and I work in. And, you know, we're really sad that we can't welcome you to the building today. But instead, we have got this fantastic virtual tour from Dr. Calder instead. And I know that he's going to do a fantastic job of bringing it to life for you while we can't actually go in and see it in person. So a little quick bit of context about the organisation. So for those of you that aren't familiar, the Royal College of Physicians, or RCP, as we'll probably all refer to it, being used to the acronyms, is a medical charity and it represents about 38,000 doctors worldwide, with the mission being to broadly improve patient health and to reduce illness. As well as being a modern medical charity, it's also an organisation with a 502 year history, so 2018 was our 500th birthday. And you know, relating to that, we have a hugely varied collection of historic and more modern items. So ranging from medical instruments to silverware, artwork to rare books, sort of, you name it, we've got most things apart from specimens in jars. That's the one thing that people expect us to have, which we sadly don't. Um, these are all cared for by the Library, Archive and Museum. And, you know, over this 500 years, to take a slightly different tack to link into today's talk. Over these 500 years, the college has been housed in five different buildings. And the one you're gonna hear about today is obviously the most recent and you know, arguably the most distinctive and most interesting. So on that note, I'm really thrilled to be joined by Dr. Barnabas Calder today. Dr. Calder is a senior lecturer in architecture at the University of Liverpool and a specialist on Dennis Larson's architecture. And he'll be sharing his expertise on the RCP's fantastic grade one listed building. And on that note, over to you, Dr. Calder. Thank you very much. Uh, all you missed me saying was I'm muted. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's a great compliment to the college that you've uh, decided to come and watch this on a beautiful sunny afternoon if you're in the UK. Uh, it's a truly superb building. It would be even better if we were there in person, but it's just short of being worth getting COVID for. So uh, I hope you enjoy the tour and store up your questions. I should be able to answer them. So points for anyone who catches me out. Welcome to this virtual tour of the Royal College of Physicians. I'm Dr. Barnabas Calder. I'm a senior lecturer in architecture at the University of Liverpool and a specialist on the work of Sir Dennis Lasden, the architect who designed the Royal College of Physicians' magnificent building. The Royal College of Physicians was founded under Henry VIII and arrived in the mid 20th century as a hugely distinguished medical organisation, maintaining standards, uh, promoting research and discussion, and with 500 years or 450 years or so at the time of things that they'd gained during that history, paintings, silverware, beautiful objects and traditions. It decided in the 1950s to move out of its house, its home in Trafalgar Square, overlooking the square in return for a good offer from the Canadian government that would enable it to build a new building uh, in Regent's Park that would fit the needs of a college of physicians that was 
responding to the arrival of the NHS on the scene. It looked around for an architect for this new building, a wonderful, exciting plum commission, and amongst the architects it spoke to was Dennis Lasden, at the time in his 40s, which is young for an architect, and a, an exciting young figure in modernist architecture at the time. He might in some respects seem an unlikely choice, and when he went to the interview, because of his modernist commitment, he thought he'd lost the job very early on, because they asked him, they pointed out of the window across Trafalgar Square at a pompous classical building the other side by Herbert Baker, uh, with big columns and all the details of, carried down from ancient Rome of a big stone London building, and they said, will you build us something like that? And he said, no and left, and thought, I've only wasted one afternoon on it. Uh, but they spoke to their architectural expert, Sir John Summerson, uh, who recommended, despite his own position as an architectural historian specialising in Georgian architecture, that they go for something boldly modern. He said they would look silly if they did something tamely classical at a point where there was such exciting new architecture developing and one of the architects that he admired was Lasden and he told them to go with Lasden and they treated it like uh, the way doctors expect their patients to behave. It was a medicine they didn't necessarily all want to take but they'd been told by an expert that it was the right thing for them and so they swallowed the pill and went with Dennis Lasden and appointed him, offered him the job despite the fact that his buildings look so unlike their classical, uh, fine but quite stodgy 19th century home at the time. Lasden then had his own time of collie wobbles about this. When he came to the job, he went along to see one of their uh, special evenings with rituals and a dinner, and he saw them processing around in robes, carrying symbolic silver objects and speaking in Latin. And he thought, a modernist architect can't design for this. This, is, this does require some kind of traditionalist architect to respond to their uh, long-standing traditions. But uh, his wife, Susan, persuaded him to have another think about it and to keep, uh, keep considering options. And he did. And the building that results is an extraordinary triumph of exciting modernism that houses, without making it feel uncomfortable or inappropriate, long-standing tradition in a way that ennobles both the architecture and the traditions. So on today's tour, we're going to have a look at the ways in which Lasden accommodated the extraordinarily unusual brief for a period that was mostly about quickly erecting lots and lots of council housing and hospitals and schools and university buildings to meet the urgent socio-economic needs of the post-war period, Lasden managed to turn a similar range of architectural ideas into a suitable home for this remarkable institution, and it's an extraordinary story and an extraordinary building. Lasden's challenges didn't end with accommodating a historic institution with modernist architecture. He also had to accommodate a challenging historic environment around his new building. The site for it was in Regent's Park, surrounded by terraces laid out and often designed by the great 19th century architect John Nash. And these had for a long time been seen as jerry-built rubbish, but by the 1950s, the, their qualities were recognised again, and they were being appreciated and restored after wartime damage. And Lasden had to fit this exciting new building into this very well-known and loved historic environment. And the first step he took in order to achieve that was to think about materials. If you look at the Nash terraces that surround the Royal College of Physicians, their main material that faces you is painted stucco, this creamy plaster surface. Lasden copied that colour as exactly as he possibly could for a porcelain tile specially made in a factory in Candolo near Turin uh, to precisely match the colour of the stucco around and used that to cover the majority of the Royal College of Physicians building. 
so that it fitted in in material terms, in colour terms, with its surroundings. If you're very sharp-eyed, you may notice that they don't match now. That's because the Royal, uh, the Crown Estates, who own the uh, Regent's Park terraces, have changed their policies on colour and gone for a creamier colour. So they betrayed uh, Lasden's careful match, which was greyer back in the 1950s. Uh, but the intention was there and the original match was perfect. The other material that he picks up on from the glorious terraces around is their roofs, which are clad in slate and sort of blue-black slate, which has a roughness to it, a really strong texture. And Lasden takes that kind of material in his blue brick that he uses in a lot of the lower parts of the college. So there's a kind of um, matching and rhyming with the terraces around in terms of the materials he uses. That's a first accommodation that makes it clear that the Royal College of Physicians wouldn't make sense somewhere else. It is specifically a building for Regent's Park. The next thing that I think he did was to look around the doors of the Nash terraces, where there are columns all along the door level. And in the Nash terraces, they're just pieces of wood with plaster on the outside. They don't carry any weight. Uh, they stand proud of the building and don't do anything. I think Lasden is one-upping them as well as referring to them. In his building, the three columns at the front carry the whole front of the building. They carry a great big library above, all of this hefty concrete coming down on these three very, very slender columns that frame his doorway. So he's quoting from Nash to some extent, but also reveling in the superiority of 1960s materials rather than shoddy brickwork and plaster to cover it up. His building is built of really state-of-the-art, beautiful, sophisticated engineering of a sort that can make these columns not just a decorative reference to history, but extraordinarily powerful structural elements in an exciting, floating building. And if you look again at the Nash Terrace next to it, that humped roof is another quotation, I think, that ends up in the final building. He lifts that humped, hipped, dark blue roof off the top of the building and he puts it next to his building as the lecture theatre, this extraordinary distorted hump of a building buried down into the ground. So what you're ending up with is a kind of Picasso portrait of a Nash Terrace. He also has a sophisticated response to the architectural ideas of his day in this building. When he was trying to think how to respond to a highly symbolic ceremonial building, in ways that would work for a modernist, exciting architecture. He thought at once about the question of how permanent things were. This was a huge issue in 1950s architecture because technology was changing so fast. So buildings that had uh, things, functions like hospitals needed to change all the time because medicine was advancing so fast. And schools were expanding so fast and universities were changing their research facilities. So buildings could go, become obsolete very, very quickly. And that was a fear of the period, but also an exciting stimulus to the period. And they tried to design buildings where bits of it would last, even if other bits had to be changed. So he started thinking about the building in terms of things that would never change. Ceremonial functions that had been the same for 500 years and therefore you could assume were not about to change as against other functions that might change sooner. This idea of things that would remain forever suited the institution very well because the functions like the library and the dining hall went back to the origins of the institution as functions and would probably always be needed. Whereas functions like a lecture theatre was a new addition in this college. There had never been one in any of their previous homes and was part of their move to start talking to a wider public uh, as the NHS got launched and as medicine in this country took a huge leap forward. So he clad the bits of the building that would never need to change in porcelain tiles, white porcelain tiles, uh, a very inflexible material over concrete, another inflexible material, and he clad the other bits that might at some stage need to change in black brick in dark blue engineering brick as a way of coding it into changeable and permanent. 
When we say changeable though, it's not really intended to be changed, it's a way of thinking about it. Lasden's work on the detailing of the blue brick sections is extraordinarily precise and wonderful. 37 different types of brick were specially made to be cut to the right design before they were fired in the kiln and then checked for quality after they'd been fired and many many were rejected. Uh, the young Edward Cullinan working on site as the site architect at one stage uh, used a lot of the rejected bricks in a self-build project he was conducting himself in Camden uh, because so many were rejected because they weren't perfectly the same texture and colour and uh, this, this level of quality in the brickwork is extraordinary and you can see the way that the brickwork of the um, lecture theatre walls for example curves and bends and distorts as it moves across in a way that's beautiful and extraordinary and challenging and not at all what you would think of as a temporary part of a building that you could remove casually. Once Lasden had broken the brief into this, these two different languages, the white tile of the permanent and symbolic parts of the building and the black brick of the more functional parts of the building, both of them reflecting Nash materials next door, he then heightened that contrast even further, apart from the fact that one is black and the other white, one is rough and the other smooth. Uh, he heightened it by the way he treated them as well. So when you look at the front of the building, you can see that he's turning the centre of the building with the library and the three columns supporting it into a kind of perfect modern rendering of a an ancient temple, something like the Parthenon Temple in Athens, columns supporting a floating top of the building. And it's extraordinarily beautiful and symmetrical and exaggerates and brings out the qualities of advanced concrete engineering of the period. The concrete and the steel in those columns and in that facade is holding itself up on almost no support, whereas classical temples have to have lots and lots and lots of hefty columns to keep them up. And he seems to be enjoying and celebrating the technological and artistic marvels of his period. But that optimism seems almost to be offset by the lecture theatre next to it, which is bent and dark and half buried in the ground. It has a window that only just peeps up above ground level and seems to have been accidentally buried. So one part of the building is white and hardly touches the ground. The other is black and hardly emerges from the ground. Uh, one is very straight and very light. The other looks heavy and is bent and distorted. There feels to be a kind of exaggerated, excited, artistic handling of these different materials and these different parts of the building, which I tend to feel has something of the feeling of optimism and positivity in the white parts and anxiety about potential nuclear war, about the great challenges facing mid-century uh, Britain and the world. And there's something really heightened about both the optimism and positivity attached to and uh, visited by this sort of slug of a lecture theatre crawling up towards it. And the beauty of both and the beauty of them together is quite extraordinary. Coming round the corner to the right hand side of the building into St Andrew's Place, we move to a more private, almost domestic setting. The houses of Nash's terraces overlooking the side wall of the college and its little private garden beautifully sheltered from the noise of the roads on each side by offices for the college on the right hand side and by the lecture theatre on the left hand side. And this little quiet green area is what Lasden put into the college brief because he was thinking about what a college is. And when he heard the word college, he immediately thought about Oxford and Cambridge colleges. Oxford and Cambridge colleges with their big central green spaces surrounded by teaching and living accommodation where in the view of uh, optimistic outsiders and sometimes in reality very clever people walk around in quiet 
enclosed space having very intelligent conversations that push forward the world's understanding of itself. Lasden here was building for a very clever body of people who were pushing forward the science of medicine and the practice of medicine at a point where the National Health Service was really getting going and starting to revolutionise the health of ordinary people. To provide them with this quiet external space in which to think and talk, he shelters this garden, this court, uh, using the building as a kind of enclosure, which echoes the policies that Nash had in designing the housing of Regent's Park, where even when the housing itself isn't the most interesting housing, which some of it isn't, it carefully shapes external spaces and defends lovely green areas. So Lasden is picking up once again on Nash's ideas and he's making it into a college. Next, let's go into the college. As you enter, try and imagine yourself as a physician who had known and loved the old building. This is the entrance staircase to the old building that they'd had in Trafalgar Square. Some of the physicians leaving a building they'd long known and loved and with a, a tradition itself of 150 years of occupation by the college, uh, will have felt sad about it. They'll have felt anxious that the new building was never going to have the same kind of uh, built up sense of tradition, the same kind of dignity, grace. So I think the entrance that Lasden offers them has a hint of that old entrance to the building by Smirk in the same architect as the British Museum in uh, Trafalgar Square. I think he's giving them a sense that you're coming home here. You are still in the Royal College of Physicians after the shock of the exterior, which didn't go down immediately well with all the physicians, the exterior. One felt that it didn't look like a Royal College of Physicians when it was first shown as a model. And I think that fear that change would lose them something was a real thing that Lasden was working to combat. As we carry on in, you'll see that the colour palette that Lasden is using in this interior is carefully very, very muted. There's the beautiful white marble of the floor, which rhymes very, very closely with the white porcelain of the tiles. The black brick makes a strong contrast, but doesn't change the range of tones. They're both very muted in tone. It's almost like black and white photography taking colour photography in the Royal College of Physicians. And the paintings that were an important part of the college's collection and which were selected by uh, from a huge collection that the college owns, the most beautiful quality paintings were selected by an expert from the National Portrait Gallery for display in Lasden's building. And Lasden is using space and a calm palette to make these beautiful works of art at home in his building so that they don't look like uh, people in fancy dress in an otherwise modern uh, down-to-earth environment. As we start up the stairs, if we look right, we can see two very fine panels of stained glass by Keith New, who was an important stained glass maker of the mid-century, uh, producing glass for Coventry Cathedral, among other interesting commissions. And it picks up on a long tradition of heraldry and stained glass in the college's older buildings. But if you notice, Lasden has mounted it in a place where you can really enjoy it going up that staircase. But where the black brick onto which it then shines takes that colour out so that it doesn't become a sudden flashing glare of colour as you... Uh, from everywhere else in this most important central area of the college, so that his muted colour palette doesn't suddenly become a kind of uh, sad, sad paleness, rather than the subtle, beautiful palette it is. And it's very important with a building with this kind of level of subtlety to avoid adding dramatic bursts of colour that the architect didn't intend and would have been very keen to avoid. Next, we're going to go across this beautiful staircase hall and into this little building within a building on the right. You may have noticed it when we were looking at the building from the garden. Sticking out of the building 
seeming to almost not want to touch the building and punching through the glass that encloses the interior. A little temple within a temple. And as we make our way into it, the interior may come as a surprise to you. It is very obviously not a straightforwardly 1950s, early 1960s interior. Instead, what you're looking at here is the panelling from the 1670s version of the college, built after their previous college was burnt down in the Fire of London in 1666. That building was by the really very important and interesting scientist, experimentalist and architect Robert Hooke. And Hooke included in that building a beautiful room with this oak panelling, Spanish oak panelling. And they took it with them when they left there and used it in the next building in, in Trafalgar Square and then brought it on again with them to the college that we're now looking at. And Lasden incorporated it. There is no writing or interview in which he expresses a strong opinion on this. He seems to have been happy to do it. It's part of their, what he affectionately called ancestral clobber, and it is a beautiful addition to the college and a wonderful surprise coming out of this high light space into this lower, darker space with a slight smell of wood about it. And he incorporates it in a way that doesn't make a joke of it, the way that a postmodernist architect might have felt the need to. It just allows it to be itself. And the only hint he gives you that you're not in a, 19, in a 1670s building but are in a 1960s building, completed in 64, is that in each of the corners, there's a little slit right by the corner for a tiny window. They let in hardly any light and they don't distract you from the panelling. Weirdly, there are blinds in two of them, presumably to keep the uh, light level down, um, but the uh, closed blinds in, in the photos we have here, unfortunately. But you can see the little slits anyway, and they, are there to tell architecture geeks that this is not a load-bearing brick building of the sort that it would have been in the 1670s. The reason a slit in the corner means it couldn't be a brick building is that the corner has to be the strongest part in a brick building because it's what stops the flat walls from folding up like a house of cards. The corner where the bricks bond in with each other is the bit that gives the building rigidity and you would never ever cut slits in all four corners of a brick room. Whereas in a concrete room like this, the steel does all the work and you can cut slits absolutely wherever you want. Lasden made this room the heart of his new college building. And I think there might be an element of his own experience coming into the way that he handles this. He was interviewed in this panelling in the previous college it's the censors room, which is an office for the senior, two of the senior officials of the college, and above all, a, a room that was used for many, many years as an interview place to decide whether you can become a member or not. And Lasden himself was interviewed for the job in this room. So he had a feeling, I suspect, that he'd been through something like the process of becoming a member of the Royal College of Physicians. And historically, this was a very, very grueling experience that you would come into this room, you would be asked difficult questions, potentially in any of the medical languages as they were then defined, which are um, French, Latin or ancient Greek. And you would have to answer in the same language at, at some periods of the, uh, the history of the examination. And for a long time, you could only sit this examination once. So it was perhaps the most stressful day of your life. If you made it, you could go on to be very senior and successful in your field. If not, there was always a cap on quite how successful you would be. And Lasden takes this room that is the kind of engine house of a building that makes people into physicians and turns it into the ceremonial centre of his design. And as he, as you leave it, as you leave this lower, darker, older room, as a successful physician. Originally, there was a separate door, this door on the right, for people who'd failed. And there's a little cubby hole out there now used as a broom cupboard. 
uh, where you can go and stand for a moment and compose yourself before you have to appear in public again to scurry out of the building never to return if you've failed. But if you succeed, you leave by this door on the left and as you come out, you're suddenly coming out into this brightness, this height, this surroundedness by portraits of other distinguished physicians amongst whom you are suddenly one. And it's such an exciting moment in your career and your life. And the architecture of the entire building comes together to dramatize this moment of succeeding in this exam. In the previous building, if you succeeded in the exam, you went next door to the library along an unspecial corridor. In this building, the, proce the, pr the procession, the process of getting to the library is an extraordinary and beautiful and exciting one. That's one of the great moments in architecture. You come out of the room here, you go onto this staircase. As you make your way up this staircase, you turn through uh, three quarters of a circle, looking around you at this great white open space with portraits on the walls of other distinguished physicians amongst whom you hope one day to rank. And you wind your way up with this beautiful vista all around you being turned in front of you as you spiral up the staircase. And something completely new in the history of human experience of architecture, every floor of this building is bigger than the floor below. You cannot do that in brick. In brick, you ha or, or in stone, you have to have a vertical wall taking the weight. Each stone has to land vertically on top of the stone beneath until you get to the foundations. In a building like this, made of concrete and steel, provided you've got vertical columns, you can put the walls and floors wherever you like. They can slide around all over the place. And that's what Lasden does in this extraordinary space. So that to people not used to this kind of engineering, as no one was in this generation, it's a totally extraordinary hallucinatory effect of a building that gets bigger as it goes up. As we reach the top of the staircase, the library is in front of us, a portrait of William Harvey, the discoverer of the circulation of the blood and one of the most distinguished members of the Royal College of Physicians of all time, uh, is straight in front of us, uh, inviting us into the library above where the fireplace would have been in an older library. But if we look left before we go in, we can look through a huge window. These are the biggest pieces of glass that were makeable at the time, bigger than anything you'd be allowed to make now because of anxieties about the health and safety aspects of maneuvering such big panes on a building site. Uh, and these extraordinarily huge panes of glass are a way of essentially breaking down the barrier between inside and outside. Another thing you can do with concrete and steel, with brick or stone, you have to just stodge your way up with mostly wall and knock some holes in it for windows. With concrete and steel, the windows can be wherever you want. They can be as big as you want, thanks to the amazing advances in glass technology during the 20th century. And they can make indoors and outdoors a matter of just controlling where the air goes and where the rain goes. And they don't need to have any impact at all on the, uh, the experience of the light and the space. So here, it's almost like being outdoors in this beautiful central space. And you look across and you see the side of the lecture theatre, you see the quiet green court that Lasden designed for them so that it would be a college. And beyond, you see the Nash terraces. And the Nash terraces are just tall enough and the building hugs down onto them just enough with the ceiling above to mean that you don't see sky between the buildings. And that brings them weirdly much closer it darkens them and, and avoids the, the great glare of skylights that you would otherwise get that would make them feel distant and make them feel like another building. And Lasner referred to this as being the fourth wall of the Royal College of Physicians, the row of houses opposite. And so strong was his architectural response that over the decades since it's become a reality and the college now has uh, offices of its own and of other medical organisations associated with it in one way or another, right the way along there, to the point where in the 1980s it was declared a medical precinct. And this is Lasden, Lasden's architecture helping the college towards a new institutional reality. That external court is not the only court Lasden provides for clever people to have learned conversations. 
Inside, too, the staircase hall itself was not in the brief. Nowhere did it say, could we have a magnificent central staircase hall in which we can congregate and which will dramatise the life of our college. Lausden added it to the design and proposed it to the college as a very good idea, and they accepted. They had extremely generous funding from the Wolfson Foundation that had just opened. It was its first major grant, and it allowed them to do this to a quality that wouldn't normally be possible. There's a wonderful minute of a meeting in which the Wolfson representative uh, notes in a very before-its-time way that the provision of uh, women's lavatories is inadequate. And then, as a general observation on the college, says, don't stint it for the sake of the odd 50,000 or so. In 1958, that's a lot of money. And they didn't stint it for the sake of the odd 50,000. They did it all beautifully. It's an extraordinarily well-made and excellent building. And this central space that we're looking at now is a place for people to mix, to see each other from above as they come up the stairs and either duck up and hide if there's someone you don't want to run into or call out to and have a coffee with. It's a place to relax, to socialise. It's the heart of the college. Carrying on now into the library. This is, I think, the other great room in the building for making the physicians feel at home. Just like the censors room, this looks very like the previous college library. It is the library of a 19th century gentleman's club building on Pall Mall, which is exactly what the Royal College of Physicians was in its previous incarnation. And it has the same characteristics. It's a two-story library lined with books, a portrait in the centre over what would have been the fireplace, uh, a modest amount of windows normally covered up to preserve the extraordinarily special collection of books that have kept in this room. Uh, and it's symmetrical, it's unchallenging, it's not frighteningly modernistic the way that you could feel that the staircase hall was if you were a timid, non-modernism loving person. However, Behind this neat orderliness is a hidden difficulty, and that is that we are now in the room that stands only on those three very slender columns at the front and middle, and then on the extreme back wall, the other, the other side, where we came in through the door. There is no support anywhere else underneath this room. This means that to support the walls and the books and the people moving around requires the weight of those corners to be transferred sideways along to those skinny little columns and sideways along to the back wall in a way that is extraordinarily difficult to engineer. There is masses of very precisely thought through steel in this room holding it up. And that steel is then tightened before the moulds into which the concrete was poured were removed. That means that if you tighten it like a guitar string, it pulls back on that concrete, holding it together so that it doesn't sag an inch when the, when the moulds come off. Normally, the way that concrete works, there's steel running through it. When you take the wooden moulds away, it very slightly sags and cracks until the steel is taking the strain. For a building as precise and as challenging in its engineering as this, you can't afford to have that sag and those, and those intended little cracks. So you tighten the steel, tighten it and tighten it until it holds together. And you can see in this photo the uh, arches of steel, the bows of steel running through this front wall before the concrete was poured, poured around them that hold this front wall up on top of those very slender columns in the middle. It's an extraordinary piece of engineering. And just if that wasn't hard enough, Lasden's cut slit windows into all the corners, which mean that the steel can't even make it to the corner. So it's a really, really lovely challenge for the wonderful engineers uh, of Arab and Partners, and particularly their partner, Peter Dunnikan, who worked on this and did an astonishing job. This building feels very 
calm and permanent and natural, but its engineering is a complete work of art. It's as much of a, a showpiece of engineering as something obviously engineering-y like the Sydney Opera House, say. This has a similar quality of sophistication and brilliance to its engineering, but in service of an architecture that isn't obviously showing off about engineering other than those front columns. So, for the physicians who are amongst the more conservative physicians, this is a comforting reminder of their previous library and a sense of continuity. For the physicians who are excited by modernist architecture and for visiting architects, this is a thrilling achievement of architectural space. And you can see that uh, extraordinary double game at its clearest when you look up at the top floor windows, these little slit windows covered by blinds in the um, in this image, unfortunately. But you can see that from inside they're symmetrical and therefore add to the feeling of classicism and, and conventionalness to this interior and dignity and stateliness. But when you look at it from the outside again, you can see that that rhythm is then continued into another rhythm uh, within the building that disguises that symmetry and makes it into an excitingly irregular barcode of windows of a sort that at the time uh, was very exciting and novel and had come from the ideas of the great Swiss-French architect Le Corbusier, who was the great architect of the period. After such an unpromising beginning to their relationship, where the, some of the college committee didn't think Lasden was for them, and Lasden didn't think he was for them, the collaboration between this body of medical experts and their architect produced one of the world's great modernist buildings. It's grade one listed as it blooming well should be. It's been absolutely loved by the physicians for its 50, more than 50 now years of life. And it's used regularly as a, a film and television set to represent luxurious, beautiful, cool, modern interiors like embassies and the like. And one of the things that was so special about the college's relationship with Lasden is that they made him an honorary member in response to how much they loved his building. And they took his advice over the years of the rest of his life until his death in 2001 on what they should do. And therefore this interior remained extraordinarily pure and beautiful in a way that's very rare right the way through that period. Other institutions forget what's good about themselves, expediently shove stuff in. This one remained extraordinarily elegant and pure, to the point where, for Lasden's memorial, one of the few disagreements he'd often had with them was that he felt they put too much furniture in the central staircase hall because he liked it to be pure and beautiful and they liked it to be somewhere to sit. And for his memorial event, it was held here and they took all the furniture out as a tribute to him, which I think is a beautiful thing to have done. They continued to uh, very respectfully and um, thoughtfully discuss subsequent changes uh, with Lasden's widow, Susan, uh, until her death a small number of years ago. And I think it's an extraordinary thing, this legacy of looking after the building that they have and I very strongly hope that it's something that they maintain into the future and make sure that their curatorship and custodianship of this absolutely unique masterpiece is as good as the building deserves. I hope you've enjoyed today's tour. If you have, there's masses more to see here. Come in person, bring a camera, when they're open again, Photograph their beautiful staircases. There's another staircase that's a spiral down by the lecture theatre. Photograph the details. Look at the brickwork. Run your hands over the mosaic. Enjoy the garden. Really throw yourself into every detail of the building. Leave yourself plenty of time because everything deserves it. It's a, a really masterly piece of craft as well as a masterly piece of architecture and one of the best buildings of its period anywhere. 
I hope this has given you a taste of that and that you are managing to see good buildings even in the current difficult circumstances and uh, that one day perhaps we'll meet at the Royal College of Physicians for a live tour. Goodbye. Okay, hopefully that's uh, finished for everyone. Um, I apologize if I've cut off the last few seconds for some of you who may have um, loaded slower for. Um, but now I'd like to throw it open and say a big thank you to Dr. Calder for putting together that presentation um, and exploring our building um, virtually, even if we can't do it in person. Um, and uh, if anyone would like to ask any questions, uh, I think now's the time. So we had one come in during the chat, didn't we, Larry, that we wanted to ask later yes, on? Yes, it was from Mitchell, and Mitchell was asking, what did the building replace? Uh, it replaced uh, Nash House. Uh, it was a house called Summary's House. It had been, uh, to some extent, Victorianized, which by the 1950s was um, seen as a very disastrous thing to happen architecturally. Uh, so it was seen as having lost a lot of its um, its uh, original quality. Actually, I think it was still rather attractive, but it had been bombed during the war and therefore was in quite a sad way. So with all of the bomb damaged parts of the Nash architecture around uh, Regent's Park, they took decisions building by building on its importance and the level of damage. They rebuilt some of them more or less from scratch when they were very important. Uh, they pulled down others which were less heavily damaged when they were less important. And the decision was taken on Summary's house that it wasn't as important. Uh, so um, it opened up this kind of isolated slot in green space, which was just perfect for the Royal College of Physicians. Lovely. We've had a quite a little flurry of more questions coming in. Um, so I'm going to take one from Craig Pemberton first. Um, he wanted to know what would be the expected lifespan of this kind of construction. Traditional brickwork can be maintained quite easily. What happens when the reinforced concrete requires maintenance, preventative or otherwise? They've done a very good job of um, steady maintenance. And uh, so it's never had the kind of neglected water flowing over things that really destroys buildings quite quickly. Uh, they've also done some bigger campaigns, for example, uh, on little bits of localized spalling, which is where the water gets into the reinforcement, um, expands the top layer of reinforcement a little as it rusts and pops the surface off, which popped a few of the porcelain tiles off a few decades ago, or uh, perhaps perhaps as 90s-ish, I can't remember the exact details, uh, and they've um, done a characteristically superb Royal College of Physicians job with it. They've ordered more from the same factory in Candolo, um, near Turin, they shipped them over, they re repaired it very meticulously, and they resurfaced it. So if you catch it at the right angle in the right light, you can just tell from the dirt of the grouting which mm -hmm. bits of the, um, of the tile are um, replacements from that period and which are original. Um, but by and large, it's doing extremely well. Unfortunately, they painted the exposed concrete on the roof tanks and on the fire stair because the original intention was that that exposed concrete would weather over time and would show its age uh, whilst the tile and the brick remain pristine because they're materials that just don't weather at all. Essentially, they'll remain the same for thousands of years, potentially. Um, so uh, originally, the slight element of dirt in the um, gaps between the tiles would have still left them looking pristine and white uh, with the concrete going increasingly um, mossy and um, dirty and streaked above and to the side. Uh, the college doesn't particularly like mess. And so sadly, <laughs> they painted those bits. Um, I hope one day that they'll uh, go to the considerable expense and effort of getting the paint back off again and letting that concrete weather. Um, it'll catch up in the end. In terms of the ultimate life of a building like this, no one yet knows. Uh, there are very, very exciting developments being made um, in a wonderful 
uh, focus by one of America's great cons conservation institutions that's working out what to do with some pre-war um, concrete buildings where the concrete technology was problematic and how you approach that repairing, replacing, restoring and preventing further deterioration. Uh, this is a very well produced building, so it doesn't have those sorts of problems. But you're right that over time, um, a piece of engineering as complex as this will need to be monitored and eventually will need some kind of action to make sure that it uh, has a long posterity. But if anyone will look after their building properly in those sorts of ways, I'm quite sure it's the college. <laughs> Thank you. There's actually um, a question from Elaine that's a little bit linked to that. So you were talking there about the use of the, the concrete and it's supposed to be bare. Elaine was asking, do you think the use of porcelain tiling on the exterior detract from the medium specificity of using concrete as found? I used to think so. I, I am a complete <laughs> devotee of the National Theatre. I think it's uh, not just Lasden's best building, but one of the best in the world. I like um, UEA's kind of U the University of East Anglia's much more uh, low budget, practical kind of concrete as well. Um, and I really do love 1960s and 50s exposed concrete. So I used to see porcelain as being something of a kind of um, softening but then the more work I've done on Lasden over the years the more I've come to realize that by this stage in his career it wasn't a compromise where he wanted to do concrete exposed all over he wanted the tiles he loved beautiful exciting materials that produced things like the white and black effect of the black brick and the white tile. Mm -hmm. He was excited by that. He found it artistically stimulating. If you look at something like the um, This Is Tomorrow exhibition, um, where all the most exciting avant-garde artists joined a group of art architects of a similar uh, forward-looking persuasion and produced very odd, interesting pavilions, um, it was it had a similar feeling of this kind of exaggerated heightened quality that those materials have so i have uh, come to realize that this isn't a kind of well this is a posh building in a posh place i'd better cover up my concrete this is someone who is still in the spirit of um of his work with Tecton, who tended to cover up their concrete. Tecton, the uh, architecture practice of Bertolt Lubetkin, where he, where he had his formative architectural years just before and just after the Second World War, uh, almost never exposed their concrete. And he was the same. He, he, he worried about the quality of his buildings and the, the ways that the finishes would survive over decades. So he only started to use significant amounts of exposed concrete once he'd seen that those technologies had reached a level where that would work. And before that, he did other beautiful, beautiful things. Thank you. Um, we've had a question from Liz, uh, who wants to know, um, she was asking about the, is there a small internal ledge or balcony in the library? Um, so it's on the shot. There shouldn't but, be. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, um, it's one of a number of compromises um, for practicality's sake. Uh, quite a lot of them in very recent years and cumulatively starting to make quite an, a big effect on the interiors, um, like the stickers with physicians' names on the windows, which feel to me like something that isn't needed and that interrupt the flow of inside to outside. I also left out of the tour the dining room because uh, it's such a very, very bad decoration decision that the um, has been made in recent years about it. And it now looks uh, a little bit like a kind of um, seaside slot machine arcade in terms of its carpet and its gold curtains and things. It's, it's not supposed to be like that. So I uh, steered around it. This one's much more understandable. It's a screen for projection. So that, that which is usually used as an event and talk space doesn't have to have a separate screen built every single time. I can understand it. I think it's not done in perfect sympathy with the building, but it's probably also fairly removable. Is the tour that um, that we based it on, that kind of internal tour that you can s navigate yourself around, is that available online somewhere for other people? It is, yes. Um, Larry, do you have the link to hand? I'm just trying to find it now. I'll post Actually, it in the chat in a sec. Yeah, we'll post Thank it in you. the chat and um, it should load so you can um, explore every room in the building if you would like on that virtual walkthrough. Um, okay, we had another one in from Elaine. Um, 
who's heard you mention Ove Arab, um, and was he the engineer responsible? If so, can you draw any comparisons with Preston bus station? Ove Arab's firm was the one responsible. Um, it's a, a huge firm. It's one of the first architectural engineering firms of any. So it, it invents the role of an engineer who is neither hired by the contractors nor hired by the architect but it represents the client essentially in the, um, in the process. And uh, OVR worked closely with Lasden uh, when, when Lasden was with Tecton and carried on doing so after that. But um, the main engineer who was involved in this was Peter Dunnikan from Arup, who was a phenomenal engineer uh, and worked with Lasden on scheme after scheme through the early 1960s and late 1950s and had exactly the right spirit that Arup himself had uh, inculcated in the firm, which is that the purpose of the engineering is to make the building work and make the building artistically what the architect wanted it to be, and not to keep suggesting, well, do you know, it would be slightly more efficient in strict <laughs> engineering terms to move this column over there, because on, under no circumstances would you have that amazing display of the three tiny columns right in the center of the front if you just were trying to work out the simplest structure to hold that library up. Uh, but the Arab's firm really understood the joy of um, deliberately, excitingly perverse engineering for artistic reasons. It was a great ex uh, Arab exhibition that there was at the V&A a few years ago that was... Mm. Yeah, that was really interesting. Um, okay, so um, have we got any more questions? We haven't had any more through in the chat, I don't think. Are there any last ones before we finish up? We're all satisfied and filled with knowledge. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you again, Dr. Calder, for a fantastic presentation and uh, answering all those interesting questions. Um, just before we head off, um, we're going to do, well, Larry's going to do a little plug. Um, so <laughs> before you all vanish. Yep. Yeah, so I'd like to add my thanks to Gail's. Thank you, Dr. Calder. That was really fascinating. That was a really great talk and I personally really enjoyed it. Um, I'd also like to thank all of you, our virtual visitors. So thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate you logging in and sort of supporting the museum that way. If you did enjoy it, We'd also really appreciate if you go and give a small, even just a tiny, tiny donation to the um, through the link on that you can see. Oh, sorry, that you can see on screen there. We're a really small museum that's part of a charity. So because of those two elements, we've been really hard hit by COVID, as many places are. And to be able to continue to run these kind of free events and to do most of our cultural activities, we really need your support. So anything you could give would be really appreciated. On a slightly more fun note, if you haven't already seen it today, we had a couple of other open house things going on and the main one you may be interested in is that one of our archivists has created a brand new video exploring the creation of the RCP through the RCP archives. So we have permission from the Lassen Estate to show some of Lassen's archives, which I don't, I'm not sure if they've been seen before, at least not on YouTube in this way, so I'll put the link in the chat and you can check that out later if you're interested. We also are running a digital event series based on our current exhibition, which is about anatomy called Under the Skin. And that's on the first Thursday of every month. So check out our website or the newsletter if you'd like more details. So yeah, thanks again for joining us. Um, if you would like to tell us what you thought of it, we'd really love to hear from you. There'll be a feedback link in the email that you'll get after the event. And we're on all the social medias on YouTube. You can find us in various places and we hope to see you again. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, so we'll sign off now. Bye.